All righty. Well, let's, uh, let's open a prayer that we'll get started. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. And Father, I just give this service over to him to do with the word what he needs to do to minister to us effectively and to answer any questions that we may have individually. And Father, I just praise you for that, that you can come in and take a service like this and just answer specific questions through what is said and done in the service. And so, Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're picking up with what we were talking about last week, about having confidence in your faith. You know, I've titled this so many things. <laughs> I said it was your confidence in faith, having confidence in your faith. It's along the lines of confidence. We'll just go with that. Uh, we started out in 1 John chapter 3, so let's go back there. But uh, tonight we're going to, instead of reading so much of the chapter here, we're going to go to verse uh, 21. And I am reading out of, this is, <laughs> this Bible goes back a long ways for me. This is the Modern Language Bible. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, June 5th of 1974. I used to put my date and my name and everything, so... That's when I got this particular Bible, and as you can see, it's kind of worn. But the Modern Language Bible is a, an interesting translation. You, you'll see as we read along here. But this is the first Bible that I was uh, studying as I heard Brother Copeland back in the day. So I've got a lot of underlinings that came out of his teaching. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse 21. Beloved ones, if our hearts do not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him. If we have confidence before God. Now, the confidence that we have before God is that our heart does not condemn us. And this next part of the verse, For we observe His commands and practice what is pleasing in His sight. Now, that's real unpopular teaching in this day of greasy grace, <laughs> as I call it. Uh, you know, where it you know, doesn't matter what I do, doesn't matter what I say. It just it, God's going to work everything out some way, somehow. You know, that kind of thing. That's not what it says. It says we'll have whatever we, we receive from Him, for we observe His commands, or His commandments, and practice what is pleasing in His sight. Now, the word commandment that's used there, as I pointed out before, is a word that means his prescriptions, prescriptions for life. Just like a doctor gives you a prescription and you fill that prescription. A commandment is a prescription for success in life. And so if we'll live according to his commandments, we'll have success. If we don't, then we don't have confidence toward God and we don't get what we ask and receive from him. See, it works the other way, too. So all these greasy grace folks go get some surprises if they haven't already that when they try to live any old way, their heart will condemn them. You know, it's not a matter of, of God has to condemn them. Their heart will condemn them because they're supposed to be doing what the Lord wants them to do. And this is His command. This is verse 23. That we put our faith in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another as He commanded us. He who obeys his commands, or his commandments, remains in him, and he in him. By this we know that he remains in us through the Spirit whom he has given us. So we need to obey the commands of the Lord. That's one of the ways we have confidence before God. And this is what we're talking about, confidence. Now, I did a little study on this. My computer kind of flaked out on me last, last week. And everything I was trying to come up with, it was just locking up on me. So I just finally said, I'm just going to go analog tonight and bring my Bible <laughs> instead of relying on the computer. So I went ahead and typed out some things here that I wanted to, uh, to be able to mention. This is the dictionary definition of the word confidence. There's three main definitions. So we're going to start with the first one. Confidence is the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something or firm trust. Now, if you compare that with the definition of the word faith, which is the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S is the transliteration, the actual definition of faith is persuasion 
that is credence, moral conviction of religious truth, or the truthfulness of God, which, I mean, that's really, you get down to what faith is, that's good de definition right there, believing that God's Word is true and reliable. You know, like Brother Kenneth Hagin said, uh, we need to act like the Word of God's true. If we really believe it's true, we'll act like it's true. All right? So that's part of this definition of faith. But it goes on. Uh, the truthness of God, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, abstractly, constancy in profession. Consistency in your confession is part of the definition of the word faith. And then truth itself. But what I want to back up to is the part of the definition here where it says persuasion, moral conviction, and reliance. It's a, it's a, a belief, a trust in God. Now, the definition from the, uh, from the dic dictionary is the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. Well, we can rely fully on God. Confidence in God is faith in God. All right. The second definition of confidence is the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Well, <laughs> that's perfectly describing our trust in the Word of God and our trust in God Himself. The feeling that we are certain about the truth of something. All right, then the third definition, a feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. Now, that definition is kind of okay, but it's really talking about your own abilities. But I think we can, can kind of make it biblical <laughs> by putting it this way. A feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of God's abilities and His qualities. See, people who look at God as the big man upstairs with the hammer is going to hit you in the head when you do something wrong, that is not appreciating his qualities. That's not appreciating who he is. And I, I'm often amazed that a lot of what the world thinks about God comes from just the fact they don't know him. They don't understand him. They think he's one way, but really he's completely the other way. Now, yeah, God is holy. Yeah, he does enforce justice, absolutely. But it's not because he, he's got, you know, this attitude like a lot of people, uh, like the bad guy, you know, on TV shows. He's just bad because he wants to be bad. You know, he's mean because he wants to be mean. That's not the way God is. And yet that's the way the world pictures God sometimes. He just wants to hit you in the head and then laugh about it. Well, that's not God's attitude. God will correct. God will instruct. But it's always to bring you into a lifestyle that allows you to have confidence, have your, your heart won't condemn you, that you'll receive from Him. It's, it's a means to an end, in other words. All right, so then let's look at a definition. This is an interesting one from an interesting source. <laughs> this is from Psychology Today, not one of the places I like to go. <laughs> but I found it interesting as I was studying this out. Psychology Today defines confidence as, confidence can be described as a belief in oneself and one's ability to succeed. Now, in the natural, I can understand where they're coming from. If you have confidence, you have a belief in your own ability to succeed. But if we have confidence in God and in His abilities and in His methods, if you will, then we have confidence in our ability to succeed in Him. Yeah. See, we turn that around and we, we, we make it biblical and it works. Now, let's look at some people in the Old Testament that actually had this attitude of confidence uh, and won't be, uh, you know, too many that we look at, but we'll just take a few here. Uh, let's look at the book of Jeremiah, which, uh, there we go. Sometimes I find it difficult to find. I don't know why. I think it's earlier in the Bible, but it's not. It's just, just me there. But number, or excuse me, Jeremiah 17 uh, and verse 14. I was much younger when I had this Bible. The print is small. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. 14. There it is. And this is the way it reads in the Modern Language Bible. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. 
Now, hold on here, Jeremiah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of good old Southern Baptists that would read this if they didn't read it religiously out of the Bible, if they just heard somebody say this. Heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Well, now, hold on. Who do you think you are? <laughs> if it's God's will and He takes a notion, He might heal you, but you need to just back off here now and, and just kind of ease back and say, O oh Lord, if it be Thy will... You know, and grovel and be a worm now. See, that's the attitude. That's a losing attitude. And that will not lead to faith. And it will not lead to success, and it certainly won't lead to healing. But here's Jeremiah saying, Heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. That's pretty confident. Well, that's what we're talking about. Confidence in our faith and our standing with God. See, if you know God's will... You know, God's will is healing. We've studied that out before. We talked about it, did a whole study on healing is God's will. So you can go back and read that, you know, or listen to that tape or message if you, if you need to. See, here I said go back and listen to the tape. We don't use tapes anymore. It's, it's MP3 files. That's okay. Showing my age. Anyway, but his attitude here was, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my praise. Now, he kept his attitude straight. No question. Thou art my praise. I'm relying on you. But see, his confidence was, if you will heal me, I'll be healed. And he called on the Lord for healing. Well, let's, let's look at a, another example that's a little, uh, little stronger even. And that's over in uh, Numbers. I said Numbers a while ago. I was headed there a little early. Numbers 12. And right here we go, Numbers 12. Now, Numbers 12 is, I'll call it the murmuring <laughs> of Miriam and Aaron against Moses. It's never good to murmur against God's appointed Amen. and anointed Amen. leader of the church. Okay? Selah. <laughs> okay? All right, but Numbers 12, verse 1. Miriam conversed with Aaron own about Moses regarding the Cushite woman he'd married. Now, just to put this in modern terms, a Cushite woman is colored dark, shall we say. She's black. And Moses married a black woman. Okay. So Miriam was not happy about this. Miriam was Moses' sister. And he said, Moses is married a black woman. You know, you can almost hear people in the South talking about that. But look at what happened because of that. But regarding the Cushite woman he'd married, for he had married a woman of Cush. They said, Has the Lord spoken exclusively through Moses? Uh-oh, see, now we get in trouble. Has he not also communed through us? And the Lord heard it. <laughs> the Lord heard him murmuring against Moses. Who does he think he is? But the Lord heard it. Now this man Moses was very gentle, more than any other person on earth. Now, I, I like this. Now, think about it. This is God saying about his man Moses, this guy was gentle more than any other person on earth. In other words, think of it this way, he's not a man to just defend himself, you know, to take up his own cause. He was gentle. He was easygoing. You know, I've had people, <laughs> people at work, I had a guy particularly, I'm thinking of him right now, I almost say his name, but I won't, because he watches my program. <laughs> and he knows who he is, because he knows I talk about him. But he told me one time, he said, I don't understand you. You just, no, nothing bothers you. People can talk about you behind your back. They can do you wrong. I've seen them say things and do things, and then you find out about it, and it doesn't phase you. Well, I'm not going to defend my reputation. I let the Lord defend my reputation. Mm -hmm. And he even told me much later. Now, see, he used to tell me all these things. Here of late, because uh, we were friends, here of late he's told me, he says, you know, I've been going to church now, <laughs> and uh, I kind of see where you're coming from on some of these things. <laughs> so, you know, he has learned where I'm coming from from a spiritual direction as opposed to in the natural. He was wanting me to defend myself and get all in, up in somebody's face, because that's the natural reaction to being abused. But uh, he saw that I handled it differently. And I can uh, appreciate what it's saying here about Moses. He was a gentle guy. He was not one 
to confront someone. He was more easygoing than that. And the Lord seemed to appreciate that because he said of, of Moses, he's the most gentle man in all the earth more than any other person. All right. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam. So he spoke to all three of them. So, you know, he did talk to Aaron and Miriam as well as Moses because he called them all together. He said, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three came out. When the Lord came down in the cloudy pillar, stood at the door of the tent, and summoned Aram and, and Miriam, so he called them out before the three of them. As the two stepped forward, he said, Pay attention to my words. Uh-oh. <laughs> if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, who is trusted in all my house. That's pretty good. Moses was trusted in the Lord's house. Wow. With him I speak in person, plainly, not obscurely. He shall view the very form of the Lord. Wow. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now I like this next verse. This, there's a lot of good teaching here in this verse 10. But when the cloud withdrew from above the tent, there was Miriam, leprous, white as snow. Now, a lot of people read this incident and think, see, God put leprosy on her. That's not what it said. It didn't say God put leprosy on her. It said when he withdrew from the tent, she was found leprous. In other words, he lifted his shield of protection. And he wasn't the one that put the leprosy on her. The leprosy, as we know, comes from the devil. Yes. I mean, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Satan's the oppressor. Jesus is the healer. Yeah. Amen. So all he did was remove his protection when he left. And he essentially turned his back on Miriam and Aaron. And of course... Satan obliged her with leprosy. So Aaron got real upset about this. Aaron turned to uh, Miriam, and when he saw that she was leprous, he begged Moses, Oh, please, my master. Uh-huh, now we're having to change heart. <laughs> oh, please, my master, do not count this offense against us, in which we have acted so foolishly, in which we have sinned. So he recognized what he did. Please do not let her be as a dead person as one who is stillborn with half his flesh uh, decomposed. So Moses cried out to the Lord. Now here we go. Look at this before we read that verse. God just made it clear that he's not happy about the situation with Aaron and Mary. When he left the tent, she got leprous. In the natural, you could kind of assume that was because God was not pleased. Okay? So he lifted his protection because of what they did. So now here's Moses. Oh God, I beseech thee, heal her. Now Moses, hold on. Check your attitude, son. After all, God just brought judgment. And now you're saying heal her? He had confidence. A, he had confidence that God is for us, not against us. B, he had confidence God's not the one that makes people sick. He's the healer. So he wasn't coming against God because God's not the one that made her sick. God just lifted his protection. Okay? So because of that, Moses cries out to the Lord and says, Oh God, I beseech thee. Now at least he did beseech him. Okay? He was being humble. Remember, he was a gentle man. He said, I beseech thee, heal her, not if it be thy will. Not, O oh Lord, please begging and sque uh, squealing about it or squirming about it, he was saying, Lord, heal her. Pretty confident. Now what happens here? What's the next thing? Oh God, I beseech thee, heal her. The Lord answered Moses. Isn't that interesting? The Lord answered Moses. In other words, if you have confidence and your heart doesn't condemn you, then you'll have what you believe for. We just read that over in 1 John. All right, so the Lord answers and says, 
If her father had publicly spit in her face, would she not be humiliated for seven days? Now, this goes back to a Hebrew tradition. You know, if a father was, was uh, uh, put out, so to speak, with his daughter and spit in her face, that dishonored her. And the tradition was that she be outside of the tent, the congregation, the people for seven days, basically to atone for her misdeeds. Okay, so God is basically reminding him, say, look, she did wrong. So she needs to be away from the people for at least seven days. She must be excluded from the camp for seven days. Then she may come back. Well, now here's the thing. If she was leprous, she couldn't come back among the people. So this is God's way of saying, I'll heal her at the end of the seven days, but she needs to stay outside the camp until, until she's healed. So she was healed over a period of time. Therefore, Miriam was excluded from the camp for seven days, but the people did not leave until Miriam had been reinstated. Then she couldn't be reinstated unless she was healed. Afterwards, the people left Hazaroth and went and made camp in the wilderness of Paran. So, a couple of things we can get out of this. Moses had confidence in who God was, his nature, and his healing ability. And he acted on that. Even though he was gentle, even though he had respect for God, even though he said, Lord, I beseech thee, he still called on God for his healing power. So, I think this is the Old Testament. I mean, we're, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. So we need to have confidence in our covenant. We need to have confidence in our relationship with God. We need to act as though the Scripture is true, as Brother Hagin said. All right, now, let's look at this word confidence from uh, 1 John, where we were looking at earlier about having confidence uh, in our heart. This word confidence is the Greek word parousia. parousia. It's transliterated P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -R -R -E parousia. Now here's what I like about this definition. This is why I was trying to get last week my computer wouldn't work with me. <laughs> the definition is all outspokenness. Outspokenness. I like that. That is frankness, bluntness, bluntness, I'll get it, bluntness, publicity, by implication, assurance, confidence, also plainness. In other words, plain talk. Not mealy mouthing, not, well, we're doing the best we can. Oh, well, if it's God's will. All of that mess, plain, straight talk. Being outspoken, being bold is part of this definition of parousia in the Greek. Now, it says in the King James Version there's 31 occurrences of this Greek word parousia. One of them is Acts 4.13, so let's turn over there. And I think you'll see where I'm, where I'm going with this once you see that. Uh, let's see. Whoops. Acts 4. I went to Acts 16, so I'm getting close. <laughs> Acts 4. Boy, these pages are so thin. Got to love old Bibles. All right, Acts 4.13. As they observed the fearlessness of speech, or the boldness, that's the word parousia, the boldness in the King James is the word parousia. As they observed the fearlessness of speech or boldness on the part of Peter and John and understood that they were men without schooling or skill, they marveled and recognized them as having been with Jesus. Pastors brought out this verse several times, talked about it. And this is what I got out of that as I was meditating on this. Knowledge of Jesus and who He is. Remember we were talking about having uh, knowledge and, and confidence in who God is and his ability, and, and how he acts in a situation, how he reacts in a situation. Knowledge of Jesus and who he is leads to bold confidence. So it is our understanding of who God is and who Jesus is, how he acts and responds in a situation. I mean, all you got to do is read the Bible and look at all the, 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 you know, the epistles, or not the epistles, the gospels, and how in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
as you follow Jesus, how he acted and what he did. There was never one place where he came into a town and said, I'm going to lay hands on you and make you sick. He never did that. And I've even challenged people, show me one place where when he went to somebody and they said, oh, Lord, heal me. He said, well, let me go away and pray and see if it's God's will. And once I find out whether it's God's will, I'll come back and I'll let you know. No, he just said, be healed. You say, well, you know, he's Jesus and he's third part of the Godhead, so of course he would know God's will. Well, isn't it interesting that God's will every single time was to heal him? Like I said, there's not an incident where he laid hands on somebody and they got sick. So you'd think out of the thousands and probably tens of thousands, maybe more people that Jesus encountered, shouldn't there have been one, you would think, that he'd say, well, it's not time yet. Or it's not really God's will to heal you. He didn't run across anybody and all of those people. Now, I believe, this is just my personal belief, I believe everything that God gave us in the uh, Gospels and the Epistle were given to us specifically so that we know what we need to know to operate here in this earth. Yeah. Okay? And I, th- I believe that because of something that John said in his uh, Gospel. He said, if everything that Jesus did and everything that Jesus said was written down, I don't think the world could hold all the books. So. That tells me that God gave us certain incidents specifically to show us how to react, how to live, how to minister. That's why he gave us these particular incidents in the Bible. So if he needed to get across to us that it wasn't always his will to heal, and it was that there were times that God wanted somebody to sick, you would assume he would give us at least one story. Just one. I'm not asking for a lot, just one. You know, I like what Pastor Keith Moore said one time. He said, you know what you need to be scriptural? You need scripture. (laughs) You can't have a doctrine based on this is how I think it should be. You got to have scripture to be scriptural. That's such a truth. That's so deep. (laughs) So what he said when he was teaching on some of these things, he said, that's why I asked people, you know, because he was teaching this particular message. He was teaching on 30 specific things that show that it's, God's, it's always God's will to heal. 30 things. He said, if somebody believes that God wants somebody sick, or that it's not God's time, or whatever, have them give you 30 scriptures, just like I gave you 30 scriptures that say we're to always be healed, said, have them give you 30 scriptures that says that God doesn't always heal. That God sometimes makes people sick. He said, and watch them squirm. (laughs) Because they won't find any scriptures. Now they may back up and say, well now our church doesn't teach it that way. Well I don't care what your church teaches, what does the Bible teach? You know, well that's not the way grandma believed. I don't care what grandma believed. What does the Bible say? Okay, that's the only, this is and I think every Christian, one way or another, would say, this is our God for spiritual truth and conduct. Okay? They would say that until you say, well, then show me where it says God makes people sick. And they'll go, well, now, you know, we got to put the Bible aside because our church teaches, well, you can already see the ground you're on is not solid. You know, you got you got to make it scriptural. So I like that. I think about that a lot. If you're going to be scripture, scriptural, you got to have scriptures. <laughs> so praise the Lord. That's what I want us to see. I actually got through my notes. Hallelujah. It's a miracle. Uh, but anyway, the thing is we need to have confidence in our faith. That boldness. See, that's why I was talking last week about when I received my healing and I said I took it. I reached out and took it. I took it boldly. And I immediately went and told all the ministers that were at the ICFM convention, which, by the way, ICFM convention is going on right now down at uh, Eagle Mountain Church. And I'm not there. (laughs) Didn't make it this year. But last year when I was there, and Brother Copeland called out somebody's being healed of a liver problem, and I said, that's mine, I take it. And then I went after the service and told all those ministers, that was me tonight. I received my healing. I went around to 
Now, Dr. Bill, that was awful bold of you to do that. I'm healed. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My liver is working perfectly. All my numbers are exactly perfect. Hallelujah. See, I like the results of the boldness. People may look at me and say, well, now, see, you're just too arrogant. Well, I may be arrogant, but I'm healed. You're, uh, you're not arrogant, but you're not healed. So I kind of like that. You know, I like the arrogance part. But see, it's not arrogance in myself. It's solid, firm confidence yes. in the Word of God. Amen. And if it comes across arrogant, I'm sorry, but it, it, I'm not here to please an individual as to whether, you know, I'm touching, feeling on their feelings, you know. No, I'm here to stand for the Word of God. Which is why when I look at some of the stuff people are saying, quote, in the name of God, uh, we had a guy recently who is openly gay who is running for president. And he said, well, now, I'm a Christian. And I just believe that uh, Trump is evil because of this, that, and the other. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're a Christian, but you're openly gay, and you've got a husband, and you are a guy, and yet the Bible says that's an abomination. Somehow I don't think you're an authority. I don't think I need to listen to you saying what is Christian and what's not. Yeah. Now, I'm not against the individual. I'm against the sin. Right. If he repented and turned and was no longer homosexual, fine. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about what the Bible says, not what you believe. Right. Exactly. Okay? But if somebody's got devils, uh -huh. I am not going to try to appease them. Uh -huh. And I'm not going to sidle up to them and say, yeah, you know, I, you, that's your opinion, but let me show you what the, what the Bible says. No, I'm going to say the Bible says... And that's it. Okay. That's why I posted on Facebook recently. You know, it's kind of my take on the, the old adage that the Baptists used to say. Brother Hagin quoted it because he was raised Baptist. About uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Okay. And, and my take is, God said it, that settles it. Okay. I believe it. <laughs> but it's settled whether you believe it or not. <laughs> and this guy, he, whether he believes it or not, it is settled. Right. Amen. Amen. You know? I mean, what the Bible says about homosexuality, it is settled. It is not up for debate. And it's the same thing with everything. It's the same thing with uh, God always heals. He always heals. It's not up for debate. That's the way it is. Now, whether you receive it, that's a whole other matter, and that's something you've got to do is get bold confidence in the Word of God. Anyway, praise the Lord. Leave me alone. I'll start preaching. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's okay. I like it. So, praise God. Well, let's, uh, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this teaching here tonight. We thank you, Father, that we actually got to cover everything. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. And uh, that we have confidence in our faith. We thank you, Father, for your word, that it is our God. It is the truth. And we stand for that. And, Father, we thank you for the people here tonight that they received openly and freely. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, we'll receive the offering. If you are giving electronically, please do so. You can send contributions to donations at fdc.org there on the Internet uh, through PayPal. Uh, if you go to PayPal, there's an option there to send finances. You can put in the donations at fdc.org, and that will, uh, you'll be able to contribute that way. Or you can use Square Cash, and Square Cash is, I believe, Dollar Faith Victory Church. Dollar Faith Victory Church is the username that you can send cash to through the Square Cash app. And that is, uh, I think they just call it cash now, the cash app. So if you go to the Play Store or go to the iTunes uh, app store, uh, you can look for the cash app and you can do that and send it to Faith and Victory. And we encourage you to do that. Praise the Lord. And uh, anybody that wants to give here physically tonight, you can do that with Brother Joe. And uh, he'll take care of that. And I just appreciate everybody coming out. I know, you know, uh, when pastor's not teaching, uh, the sheep seem to stay away sometimes. <laughs> but that's okay. He gave me full authority to teach the Word here tonight. So praise the Lord. Well, I enjoyed it. Hope you did too. And you're dismissed. Praise God. Praise God.